Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies, I've got a great podcast for you today. We are talking about hormones and longevity. And I'm asking Dr. Smith, she's been on before, Dr. Pamela Warshin Smith, she's like the guru in women's hormones. She's my mentor, whether she knows it or not, I follow her on all of her conferences to learn what it is about hormones in particular that helps us to be healthy and optimize our health, but also just helping us to live long, vibrant lives. And one of the biggest things I want you to be thinking about with this podcast is like, there's, there's hope for you. You do not have to become your mom, your grandma, your aunt, someone who didn't age well. You can keep your weight in check. You don't have to gain weight. It's not this rite of passage. You don't have to get a medal of honor for all of these hormone symptoms. You can slow down the aging process. You can t- totally work with your body and you can find the happy balance with your hormones. Now we're going to be talking about what you can do with bioidentical hormones and I'm hoping to dispel some myths because I personally do use quite a few bioidentical hormones in my office versus herbs because the bioidenticals are stronger and especially more effective once someone goes into menopause. Now the herbs are lovely beforehand. But what brings it all together? How you manage stress. So we're gonna be talking about stress, we're gonna be talking about the gut, we're gonna be talking about insulin and blood sugar, all kinds of things that you want to be thinking about as you age and what really, really helps with longevity. Now, Dr. Smith has been in the game for a long time. She even said in this podcast, she is now 68 years old. She worked for over 20 years in Detroit in one of the roughest ERs you could imagine and then went out on her own. She runs a successful functional medicine practice where she focuses on hormones and she she's precision medicine all the way, meaning she's testing, she's dialing things in and helping folks to optimize their health. So this is going to be a fun podcast. She and I love chatting, but also it's packed full of information. So if you're wondering what you need to do with your hormones as you get older, or you're in perimenopause, menopause, or you're wondering if you're there, this is the podcast you want to listen to. Plus, we've got a preview. Guys, you're not left out of things coming this winter. She's got another book coming out just for guys. But hey, it's a good one to listen to whoever you are, so you can understand hormones a little bit because the base here isn't entirely different between males and females, even though it's more female focused. All right, so I'm done talking. Let's get you to the information. Let's get on to the podcast. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krause, and I have Dr. Smith on again today. I've been counting down the days to this podcast. I can just like I I can scream. I'm so excited because this is like the subject that I love more than anything, hormones and longevity, because we need to be thinking about hormones if we want to be thinking about longevity. And and Dr. Smith is the master in this department. So Dr. Smith, welcome to come back on. And thank you so much for, for just hanging with me and coming back on again. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation. You are correct. Our favorite thing to talk about, but it's so important when we look at longevity. Mm hmm. You know, one of the things you said, and, and I quoted it to the best of my my remembrance, because it's stuck in my head since you said it. You know, I've heard you say it maybe twice in, in the conferences I've listened to you speak. And this was why would you want to spend half of your life without hormones? And and this was the concept that I think it hit me at that moment going, oh, my gosh, this is something that no one's really talking about what the impact is when hormones decline, because a lot of women will come into my office and go, all right, doc, how long do I have to be on these things? How fast can I get off of them? And I'm like, um, we need to talk. And so we have you today to help shed some light on hormones, bioidentical hormones, all those things, because there's so much confusion in this land. There really is. And it's surprising because many women do not know how their bodies work. And in all honesty, a lot of their practitioners do not either. Uh, They think that the word estrogen is evil. And as we're going to look at today, it is certainly not an evil thing because estrogen has 400 functions in a woman's body. 
let's let's talk about some of those. I mean, I could keep you here for a week talking about all 400, but let's let's talk about the top ones because I think a lot of people, like you said, it, we do have this demonized like, ooh, estrogen excess or estrogen dominance and ooh, we need to get rid of it concept. Let's Let's shed some light on that a little bit. Well, estrogen is taste, touch, smell, hearing, skin tone, lowers cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure, is memory, literally helps prevent heart disease, all these functions. And people shouldn't be surprised because when they're 30, commonly their cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure are normal. When do these things start rising? When they start to lose hormones. We put on weight. It's important to have estrogen and balance of progesterone to maintain weight the way we want it to be, the average woman gains 20 pounds at menopause. She does not have to. It's not a requirement. It has to do with hormonal imbalance. I like these. It's not a requirement. It's not a rite of passage. You do not have to become your mother is one of the things that we talk about in my office. And, and I think that's so important about that because, yeah, I think a lot of people are just like, well, here it is. It's going to happen. It's all downhill from here. I mean, even my sister-in-law, when I turned 40, she was like, give me, gave me a card. And inside the card, it said, your mysterious symptoms will now begin. And I'm, why do they have to begin now? Why? I don't want them. No. Not well, they don't. In fact, literally when your hormones are balanced, because I will be 68 next month, I can attest to the fact that menopause is the best time in a woman's life because my hormones are balanced every day. Our patients feel the same way because their hormones are perfect. No longer do we have a 28 day up and down that women <laughs> experience throughout their life before menopause. Now I feel fabulous every day. I'm sure it, all the patients do that really have hormones that are balanced ongoing. And people ask, do we take them off of hormones? No, we don't. It's such a great point that you made. Really, we keep them on hormones until they're 100 or past 100 years of age. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I literally, if I die with mine in my cabinet, that's great. I'm cool with it. I mean, it's and it's it's a hard concept to breach. I, I find that because I'm a naturopathic doctor, a lot of people are coming to me and they're going, hey, doc, how can we do this herbally? And, and I'm always like, oh it's so hard. Will you shed some light a little bit on the, the difference between trying to balance your hormones herbally and, and using bioidentical hormones? Absolutely. First of all, herbals are very important. Black cohosh, dung quai, chase berry, those are great to help balance the symptoms when the hormones are slightly out of balance. Mm -hmm. But replacement is something entirely different. When people actually lose their hormones, then herbal therapies will not be enough to actually replace. And women do have three estrogens, E1 estrone, E2 estradiol, E3 estriol. E1, we don't replace because it's linked to breast cancer. Mm -hmm. E2 is the 400 functions. And most patients are surprised to find out that E3 estriol literally helps prevent, prevent breast cancer. And people think this is new information. The first article came out in JAMA in 1924. So yes, it has been almost 100 years that we have known that E3 estrogen helps prevent breast cancer. So not new information. The only way to have this is to have a prescribed E2 and E3 made by a compounding pharmacy. There is not a drug company that makes E3 estrogen in North America. Interesting. Interesting. I did not know that. I did not know that. I would, you know, I kind of obviously I live in bioidentical land and, and compounding land. And so I didn't even think about the fact of like, oh yeah, I guess they don't make that. Hmm. They do not. And we always, when we replace estrogen, put it on the skin. Uh, it's very important not to give it by mouth because by mouth it can cause blood clots. It actually increases inflammation. It can cause gallstones. It lowers growth hormone, the hormone that keeps you young. When you put it on the skin, it is just the opposite. It does not lower growth hormone. It does not cause blood clots. It, it's pro, not pro-inflammatory, it's anti-inflammatory. So it's imperative that it be put on the skin 
It should be put on an area where there are fat cells. For most women, no matter what they weigh, even if they weigh 90 pounds, that would be the thigh. But we rotate sites and rub in for two minutes. I have been working on a song that is like right around two minutes long. I haven't come up with one that's exactly two minutes, but when I find one, that's what every one of my patients is going to get a copy of that song. And what a great idea. I even thought that, or maybe I can talk like a meditation of some sort where I'm like, you are rubbing in this wonderful stuff. I don't know. I I'm coming up with something on it because that two minutes, man, it gets, it's hard. And then we end up having trouble when we're trying to regulate the, the dosage for someone if it's under applied. So I came to you today with a whole bunch of questions from my, my patients, from my Facebook group. And a big one that folks were asking about is why is it when they do see a medical practitioner for hormones that it seems like it takes forever to adjust them and get the right dosage if they ever find the right dosage at all? Well, a number of reasons. First of all, it's really important that you see someone who is trained in hormone replacement, fellowship training, master's degree, uh, people who actually do separate training to learn about hormones. This is not something that is taught in medical school. Also, it's really important to measure by saliva testing. A lot of practitioners do not measure or they use serum. When you put the hormones on the skin, they do not show up in the blood or serum. And so the patient will be overdosed. So it would be hard to balance if you're overdosing the patient. So you have to do saliva testing. We prescribe the hormones, do saliva test in 90 days and every six months thereafter. So sometimes people only check it once a year, which is not adequate. If you gain or lose 20 pounds, then we need to recheck it. And then the conductor of the hormonal symphony is thyroid. If thyroid is not working perfectly, then it's hard to adjust. And cortisol, the stress hormone, has a direct relationship with estrogen and some of the other hormones. So if people are stressed, they stay stressed, they don't want to work on stress with a practitioner like you or I, then it's really hard to regulate the hormones because that symphony has a lot to do with stress as well. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I like, I like, it's kind of like having someone else <laughs> tell your children that this is, you know, yes, this is real. This is a thing. So yes, it, it, it seems that when folks come to me, there is some ups and downs and yeah, if I struggle, it's, it's a stress thing. And a lot of folks don't love having to, to really get into their stuff, but stress is a huge factor when it comes to hormone balance, even away from taking bioidentical hormones. It is. And people can have stress at any age and stress reduction techniques are so important. Prayer, meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, Qigong, exercise, massage, breathing techniques, acupuncture, acupressure. It's not just high, let's go take something. It's about really working through the process, having that meditation time, having that time for prayer. And then we give people adaptogenic herbs like ashwagandha, ginseng, rhodiola, calming herbs, chamomile, lemon balm. I literally keep calming herbs in my desk. If I'm having a bad day, I open up my desk and take some. It really does help. You take the right ones. They don't make you drowsy. They don't take the edge off so that your brain doesn't work. All of those are misnomers. It really hormonal therapy in conjunction with the herbal therapy is perfect. Nice. Nice. Yeah. What, so tell us what's in your, what's in your drawer. What's your magic formula that you have. And, okay. and keep in mind folks like Dr. Smith's going to tell you too, is that, you know, we all have our different formula, but I'd like to hear your little secret. What do you, what do you got in that drawer there? What I have in this drawer is a product called TranQ, standing for tranquility. It's made by Metagenics. There's a lot of really great companies. Uh, you and I both use many nutraceutical companies in our practice. I have my favorites for different things, but when it comes for stress, it just has a little bit of passion flower, chamomile, lemon balm, et cetera, just really to take the edge off. <clears throat> it is absolutely wonderful. Nice. Nice. Yes. Ladies, seriously, I think everyone should have their stash at work, their stash in their purse, you know, glove compartment. If you don't have a big purse, whatever it is, it, it, it's, it's 
go to. It's go to. I, I love L theanine, the ashwagandha. I mean, it's all of those things. And so that leads me into another question that someone had asked from my group about the, the herbs and, and asking more on the lines of, is it best to start taking the herbs for balancing hormones a year, 10 years, how, you know, and, 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 and I have to preface this by the person didn't let me know where they are in their age range. But the idea here is how long before heading into full menopause should someone start thinking about balancing their hormones herbally? Well, it, first of all, it really is, <clears throat> excuse me, a very customized and individualized care. So it's different for every single patient. So one example would be if the patient is overweight, then estrogen is stored in fat cells. They may not lose estrogen at menopause. Mm -hmm. Just because they stop cycling does not mean that estrogen is low. My best friend is 72. She weighs 300. She still has estrogen. So we don't want to give estrogen to her. She has plenty. So that's part of why we measure. Younger women do need herbal therapies and sometimes hormones when they have PMS, PCOS, PMDD, infertility. It's not just perimenopause and menopause. Many women have different changes and imbalances of hormones at every age. And particularly for PCOS, we work with hormones with women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and herbal therapies, even when they're 17, to try and prevent disease on down the line. That's, that's incredible. That's incredible. Cause I think a lot of people do think like there's this age, there's this magic age at which you can start hormones. And, and I'll be honest, even in it, with all my training, I, in the back of my head kept thinking, okay, I know I need progesterone. Chase Berry's not doing it. Evening Primrose isn't doing the trick, you know, and I kept fighting it going, I'm not old enough. I'm not old enough. I think it's a, it's, it's common to hear this. Well, normal menopause anyway is 35 to 55. So many women have symptoms two, three, five years before they go through menopause. So you could be 30 and still have perimenopausal symptoms. And certainly PMS is common, which is usually a low progesterone state. Sometimes that can be fixed hormonally. Sometimes you need the prescription progesterone. And PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, very different than when I first started practicing. It was called Stein Leventhal. And I was told I would see two, three, maybe four cases in my entire career. I now see 10 cases a week. And so the incidence has increased. And with PCOS, people have high testosterone. It's important we lower it or blood sugar goes awry people put on weight and later on will have an increased risk in heart disease and diabetes. Also with PCOS, if we don't help early on, there's an increased risk in breast cancer that can occur because homocysteine may go up, meaning poor methylation. C-reactive protein and inflammatory marker is commonly elevated in PCOS. Even if you're 22 years of age, we don't want anybody to be inflamed and it doesn't matter if they're 20, 50, or 80. A small amount of inflammation heals too much is not a great thing. So we work with patients of every age group when it comes to hormones. Uh, it's surprising when we tell people that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's something I see in my practice all the time. It's, it's like I said before, it's like this magical number where we're supposed to start thinking about it. Kind of like you turn 40, you need to get your mammograms. If you have no history, you know, in your family of breast cancer, it's like, that, that's what happens. Or like 50, it's time for colonoscopies. It's like this magical time in between those two things where it's like, do I need hormones? What do I do? <laughs> and it's important to look at cortisol at any age because everybody has stress. Mm -hmm. So even if people don't need hormones or choose not to take hormones, we still want to look at cortisol and see where that stands. And the best test for that, six clinical trials, is a salivary test. So that does have to be done by saliva. And by the way, folks, it is not literally a swab. You spit into the tube. Yes. 
Yes. And it can be quite fun if you have any thyroid issues and saliva isn't quite producing very well, but it's, it's good. I mean, I, I pretty much everyone who comes in is going to get a saliva cortisol test for me because I do feel like not knowing someone's level of stress impact on the body, you're, you're flying blind when, when you're working on any health condition, I, I kind of think. Well, exactly. Cause when you're first stressed, cortisol elevates, but when people have been stressed for a long time, then it becomes too low. And that's worse because you have to have cortisol to live. If you don't have cortisol, you die in seven days. So the body will take the hormone pregnanolone. I'm going to spell this for everybody because it is your hormone of memory. And of course it's hard to say and hard to spell. So it's pregnanolone, P-R-E-G, N-E-N-O-L-O-N-E, -E, pregnanolone. Again, it's your hormone of memory, but pregnanolone directly will make cortisol to keep you alive. So you can have low pregnanolone even when you're 24. Pregnanolone is a mother hormone. So it makes estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, and again, cortisol. So all those hormones will not be normal if pregnanolone is not normal. And we get what's called pregnanolone steel, where the body takes pregnanolone to make cortisol just to keep you healthy. It's a crazy thing the body does with that and seems to be, you know, more and more common these days. I'm sure you're seeing more and more depleted folks than excess folks over time, especially depending. Absolutely. The other thing we're seeing is people who have too low of cholesterol. Mm. You know, cholesterol is not evil. It's only evil when it becomes inflamed. You have to have cholesterol to make pregnanolone to make all these other hormones we've been talking about. So if the total cholesterol goes below 140, then it won't make pregnanolone to make the other hormones. Sometimes cardiologists forget this. That doesn't mean I'm anti any medication or nutrient, but you still, the science is a science. You have to have a total cholesterol of 140 to be healthy, to make everything else. Makes sense. It makes sense. What's your go-to recommendation for folks to increase their cholesterol if they are below or at right at that 140? It's actually to find the cause of the problem. And the number one reason people have low cholesterol if they're not on a medicine is amino acid deficiencies. So we don't have to guess, we can measure your amino acids. If they're low, we can give you amino acids and fix the cause of the problem. Nice, nice. You know, it is, it is very, it's starting to be very big issue that I'm seeing lately is the low cholesterol in folks not on meds and especially in men. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon I've been seeing lately. A lot more. Well, and it is interesting when we look at men as well, because we never used to see males with low testosterone under the age of 42. And now we are for a number of reasons. Um, that will be addressed in my upcoming book that comes out in December called Maximize Your Male Hormones. So <laughs> if we fix her, we have to fix him. Uh, so my newest book is What You Must Know About Women's Hormones, second edition. So please make sure you get the second edition. It's brand new. So the first edition was literally this thick. That's how much information was out in 2003. Then that was called HRT, The Answers. Then the first edition of this one was this thick. Now look at it and the references are online. There are so much references. There are so many and there's so much science now that we can't even fit the references in the book. Oh, and this covers women of all ages. It covers thyroid. It covers osteoporosis. We don't want people to have bone loss either. Yeah. Yes. That that's a big one. We should, we should talk about that now. Just a little preview though, going back folks, you know, who's coming back in December on the podcast, right? Okay. Noted. Now <laughs> osteoporosis, that's a biggie. I have found, you know, treating it naturally is a bugger unless we've got someone on bioidenticals. Is that kind of what you've seen as well? Absolutely, for a number of reasons. Estrogen maintains bone, but it doesn't build it. So anytime we give estrogen, we give progesterone for balance. Even if you've had a hysterectomy, they always go hand in hand. On the saliva test, you will see the ratio 
between estrogen and progesterone. So, so important. Progesterone does the bone building. Testosterone builds bone and is the strength of bone. DHEA does all of the above. If you stay stressed, it breaks down bone. Even if you exercise, you take nutrients, you take hormones, you do still have to deal with stress when it comes to bone structure. Mm, yeah, yeah. No, that, that makes sense. So we, so we got to be walking. We got to get the weight bearing stuff in, maybe a little bit of hopping to get a little bit more going there. Now, I think you like dancing. That's your, your exercise of choice. It is. And when you exercise for bone structure, the exercise has to be on the ground. It doesn't mean that swimming's not great and bicycling is not great. They are, but they don't maintain bone structure and they don't build bone. So you literally have to be on the ground to build up bone structure. Good point there. Good point there. So folks, take, take the notes there. Now, I want to twist this now into a conversation about some stuff that folks sometimes have a hard time telling me about, but I have a great couple questions here in terms of vaginal tissue and vaginal health. Now, we had talked about the three hormones and we didn't quite go into full on about estriol and its benefits for, for vaginal tissue. And I have a couple questions. I've got someone that's asked, does estriol help when someone has chronic vaginitis? And then I've got another question that's tied into that. Can it help my libido? So I'm going to let you take that one over and, and kind of navigate that one for us. Estrogen does somewhat help with libido. Uh, if you have actual vaginitis, that's an inflammatory component that's different than vaginal dryness. Estriol does help with vaginal dryness. Uh, we have a compounded, it's wonderful. Uh, we usually use one to two milligrams. Uh, we use it nightly for two weeks, Monday, Thursday for two weeks, and then as needed. And that varies from woman to woman. Uh, when it comes to looking at some of these other things though, uh, progesterone is important for overall health, uh, including um, vaginal areas as well. Uh, progesterone is the hormone that increases when you're pregnant. If you don't have enough progesterone, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, mood swings, depression, heart racing, bladder problems, gut disturbances. So important to have progesterone, which leads us to testosterone. Everyone thinks you asked about sexual interest. I don't have sexual interest. It's because I have low testosterone. That is not true. And there's a lot of people out there thinking that every single woman needs testosterone. Only one fourth of women ever lose testosterone in their life. Wow. As I said before, I'm about to be 68. I have normal testosterone. It's dead center. If I haven't lost it now, I'm never losing it. If you give people like me testosterone, what it does is it increases our risk of heart disease and our blood sugar goes up. Of that remaining one half at menopause, one fourth of those people or one fourth of people will have high testosterone, one fourth of people will have low. Mm -hmm. So if the testosterone is too high at menopause, we want to lower that. We usually lower it with herbal therapies like saw palmetto and EGCG and white peony and things of that nature. They work great. We don't want to leave it high, increase risk in heart disease, et cetera. So that only one fourth of women actually have low testosterone to begin with in their lifetime. That excludes oral contraceptives. Mm -hmm. If women are on birth control pills, then they do tend to have low testosterone. So they may need testosterone at a younger age if they choose to use oral contraceptives. So there is a variance that occurs. The number one reason for decreased sexual interest is literally stress. It's not low testosterone, low estrogen. It is stress. <laughs> yep, sure. I mean, think about it, folks. You're stressed. Your system's like, it is not time to procreate. We have to get away from this bear. The bear is going to catch us if we get, you know, intimate. So got to be thinking about these things. Now I do have another question and this one comes up a lot for me in my office and I'll see it from time to time. It seems like there's a certain ratio of women that can't tolerate progesterone very well. And so we switch it, you know, for, um, so folks, just a little bit of uh, kind of clarity here as to what I'm talking about. Oftentimes progesterone is given in the evening. But sometimes we have a few set of women that just can't tolerate it. And so we have to switch it around for them. 
Would you shed some light on what's going on in their body when progesterone gives them a little more anxiety, more insomnia, when I've told them that progesterone should actually calm them down and now they're mad at me? Well, if they're overdosed, they will get the same symptoms as if they don't have enough. So that's the first thing. Also, if you're giving progesterone orally, the gut has to work in order for progesterone to actually work as well. So that's number two. Uh, we can give progesterone on the skin, which we tend to do in younger women. So we can have it applied on the skin. But if you have insomnia, the progesterone should be orally because that way it crosses the blood brain barrier and has a nice calming effect because it affects the GABA receptors. So there's a number of reasons if it's oral, why it doesn't work. Certainly overdosage is one. Number two is the gut is not healthy. Number three is stress. Yes, everyone's stress is an interplay here because you have receptor sites for all hormones and cortisol's receptor site and progesterone's receptor site are actually one receptor, but the body will preferentially bind cortisol over progesterone. So you can have progesterone and it will sit there and not bind to the receptor site if it's busy binding cortisol. It really is all about balance. My goodness, my goodness, that darn stress. Well, you know, if we haven't made the case yet, folks, for making sure that you put your stress in check, I, I think we, we might have got there. So we'll see where we get when we dive into a little bit more of the longevity topics. Now, let's, let's switch gears a little bit because one of the biggest things, obviously, besides stress for longevity is making sure we're sleeping. And I just did a survey doing a little market research on my ladies in my practice and found that almost 100% of them have sleep issues. And most of them, I would say 75% of my patients who I'm working with hormones on, you know, they were like, before we started hormones, I was worried that if I didn't sleep, I was literally going to age so fast that it was going to be disturbing and I wouldn't be able to take care of my business. So tell us a little bit about hormones and sleep and how that plays in for longevity. Well, there's a lot of hormones that affect sleep. Estrogen does because it actually regulates some of the neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA. Serotonin, your calming neurotransmitter, 90% is made in the gut. So again, the gut would have to be healthy. Progesterone very much regulates what happens with sleep. Again, if you need progesterone, it would be oral. But stress, if you're stressed, you will not sleep well. Your mind will chatter and you'll have trouble falling asleep. Your mind may still stay active and you'll wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> and then of course, melatonin. I do cover melatonin in my book, The Hormone of Sleep. It's not just for sleep though. Melatonin is an immune modulator, meaning that it helps your immune system function at an optimal level. The number one reason that people don't have enough melatonin is the crazy thing you and I are sitting in front of right now, the computer and cell phones because EMFs do lower melatonin. And a lot of my patients, when they can't sleep, I just have them turn off their cell phone, their computer at 7 p.m. and remarkably, they are just, oh my gosh, all of a sudden I can sleep. It's miraculous, it's fabulous. Yes, that was the answer. The neurotransmitters though can not be normal, like GABA. And so nutrients like theanine may be very beneficial for sleep as well, but we can measure neurotransmitters. We don't have to guess that's a urine test and we can see where those stand. I love that we can do that. I, I, oh, knowing neurotransmitters, I feel like really does give a little more insight into the whole picture, especially when I'm looking at a perimenopausal or a menopausal woman, just to kind of have the whole gamut of what's going on. It does. And when it comes to longevity, it does matter where the neurotransmitters sit. It does matter if you sleep. It does matter if your hormones are normal because estrogen does equal memory. It has a significant effect on whether you develop heart disease or not. And at what age you develop heart disease because estrogen literally lowers cholesterol. It raises good cholesterol it actually helps lower blood pressure. It gets rid of oxidation and inflammation. It even affects aldosterone and other things that make your blood pressure go up 
and increase your risk of heart disease. So when it comes to longevity, do hormones have a lot to do with it? All of these hormones we have talked about today do. Mm -hmm. And, And I think that's an important component because going back to what I had stuck in my head all of these years from hearing you speak is that going half your life without hormones is crazy. And no wonder we have certain health conditions and things of that nature develop, you know, heart disease first and foremost, like you just mentioned, the connection with estradiol. I mean, it's, isn't women, the number one killer of women's heart disease. It still is until you get to be 95 and then it becomes infection. So all the way to 95 is heart disease and women in heart disease are different than men. For women, it's more about triglycerides, the fat content than it is cholesterol. And only 2% of women, when they have a heart attack, get chest pain that is on the left side, only 2%. Women may get right-sided chest pain, they may get nausea, they may get fatigue. I actually had one of my regular patients sitting in front of me, we were doing a hormone visit and she just looked terrible. And I said, are you feeling all right? She said, oh, I'm just so tired. And as we talked, I realized that she was probably having a heart attack. So I called the ambulance. She was not happy with me, but I said, you have to trust me. You know, you have to trust me. I called the ambulance. And when she got to the hospital, she did indeed have an acute MI, otherwise known as a heart attack. And her only symptom was extreme fatigue. So women in heart disease, very, very different than men in heart disease. Mm -hmm. That's a huge point. Now, folks, Dr. Smith was an AER doc for over 20 years in Detroit. So she she knows her stuff on on heart attacks. But man, yeah, that, you know, oh, man, I've had only one person in that situation in my office where we had to send them in and sure enough, same thing. Um, it's, it's wild. It's wild, but it's somewhere we don't want to be. So that's why we want to be looking at Dr. Smith's book, Hormones and Longevity, because this gives us the insight and, and kind of relieves some of this confusion that's going on at, with all of the do this for hormones, do that, you know, 85 detoxes, you know, again, everything's going to be okay. It's, it's maddening to me. So one of the things about hormones and longevity that I tend to think about too with folks is, is the impact on the digestive system and, and how estrogen really has a huge impact on your digestive system health. It absolutely does. If you have dysbiosis, meaning too much bad bacteria and not enough good, then it's really hard for all these hormones to work well. That does include estrogen. It does have a direct effect because the metabolization or the breakdown of all the hormones, but particularly estrogen does not occur just in the liver. Yes, the liver is huge, but these hormones are also broken down in the gut. So the gut's not healthy. The estrobolone, how the bacteria in the gut break down estrogen does not occur correctly. And then you do have an increased risk in having breast cancer. So the liver has to work, the gut has to work. In fact, cortisol, that hormone, if you stay stressed, guess what happens? It literally increases your risk of dysbiosis and leaky gut syndrome, where the gut wall is not is semi-permeable, it's supposed to be, and no longer is, and bad things go back into the body. So hormones have a great deal to do with the gut. We used to think melatonin, our sleeping hormone that we mentioned, that all that was made in the pineal gland in the brain, it's not. A good portion of it is actually made in the gut. So the gut has to be healthy. Uh, I always get asked, is it more important for the patient to have hormones that work and balanced, or is it more important to have gut health? Honestly, the patient's not healthy until both of those things work well. I I would wholeheartedly agree. I'd wholeheartedly agree. I think, you know, for a lot of people, it's, this concept is something that we need to keep repeating over and over again, because we've compartmentalized medicine a lot and we've got, you know, the gut health gurus and the hormone health gurus, but it's like, we need the whole health gurus here to, to help folks get everything dialed in a little bit better. Excellent point. It's not about dividing them out. That's what conventional medicine has done. You have a heart problem, you see a a heart specialist. You have a neurological problem, you see a neurologist. They never even talk to each other. Yeah. 
it's not divided out between them. It is the interplay that happens with everything in the body. So I have another question from, from the folks that I just realized I skipped over and it plays in well here because it is a longevity question. And then the next ones are all vanity longevity. So we'll ease into that department last. The, the bladder and, and conditions with prolapse, conditions with chronic UTIs, kind of going along the same with vaginitis and, and, and that sort of thing going on there. How much of bladder and, and prolapse and, and UTIs and things of that nature are played in with the progesterone estrogen balances? Well, progesterone and estrogen both help the innervation of the bladder. So they both have the regulation so that people don't have incontinence or problems when they laugh, cough, sneeze, et cetera. If you have actual prolapse, then that's a functional problem. And what that means is, yes, you probably do have to have surgery to have that fixed. There are some things that that's what surgery is for. If you have a mechanical issue, then those usually have to be treated with a surgeon. You know, if I tear my rotator cuff in my shoulder, I can do all the physical therapy in the world, but if it's a full tear, eventually I will go to surgery. If the prolapse is large enough, then usually surgery has to be done. And that the number one cause is having more than two children because everything prolapses down. When it comes to urinary tract infections, that's different, particularly people with chronic UTIs. A chronic urinary tract infection newly discovered, and part of that research was done by our practice, may very well be a fungus mm -hmm. and not a bacteria because people are given, you know, they go to the urologist and, and they have an infection and they give them an antibiotic and the next month they get one. And, you know, every month they're on an antibiotic and then the gut doesn't work and yeast overgrow. So for those people, we actually give them a prescription antifungal agent for two months. And then we followed up with six to 12 months of herbal therapies that get rid of the fungus. And then that usually helps whether it's chronic sinusitis, prostatitis, UTIs, vaginitis, if the fungus have gotten hold, then that becomes a different issue than a bacterial infection. That makes sense. That sheds a lot of light on folks probably right now who maybe are heading into menopause or maybe are taking care of their elderly patient or their patients or, or parents, because it does seem that as females get into the 80s and, and 90s, there seems to be a lot of bladder stuff going on with time. Well, and caffeine does, for most people, negatively impact the bladder. So if you're drinking six cups of coffee a day or iced tea or tea, then most women after the age of 60 will have a bladder problem. So, <laughs> you know, cut back on the caffeine. Also, just a very practical, easy thing to do is also helpful. Mm, I like your, I like your lifestyle stuff. So we definitely got to get there. I've got one more question and this one leads down the vanity side of things and uh, we'll get into that. And then we're going to talk about like, what, what do folks need to do on the, like the baseline, like reducing coffee, things of that nature for longevity. So this question here has to do with skin and having good looking skin. So what they're wondering is, is it all estrogen for the skin and what do you do topically to help keeping your, keep your skin looking so good? Oh, honestly, the skin, two important things. I guess what? They're the same things we've been talking about. It has to do with hormones and the gut. So <laughs> let's start with some diseases and then we'll move into aesthetics. So okay. if you have acne, atopic uh, dermatitis, if you have psoriasis, those are autoimmune diseases related to the gut, except for the acne, but it's still related to the gut you have an inflammatory process going on, which usually is related to the gut, fix the gut and all those diseases work better. When it comes to aesthetics, hormones play a big role. Estrogen is the smoothness and the softness. It helps build back the collagen. Uh, in part three of my book, there literally is three things that hormones work great on. We explore memory, we explore heart health, and we explore what the hormones do to the skin. Nice. Progesterone has to do a lot with whether the person has good blood supply. Testosterone holds it all up. So that's important. It's the firmness. DHEA does all of the above. So do hormones affect the skin? 
absolutely positively without a doubt. Uh, estrogen even affects the pore size. So there's many things that are affected. Can you compound prescriptions that have hormones on them to put on the skin? Yes. Uh, we commonly use a baby amount of estriol, the E3 estrogen for that. And of course it's fun. You can do face creams and eye creams and neck creams. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to look better and feel better both. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. The, the person who asked this is also like, and what brands do you, <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you compound it? So, I mean, and even on my end, I'm like, what is your compounding formula? Is it a PCCA one? Do you have a it base is, there? Usually okay. there are a number of PCCA formulas that work great for this. Some have a little B12 in it and other things, but yes, a PCCA pharmacists will have all of those great different prescriptions for the patient. Excellent. So folks, if you want to know more about that, you can chat with me or if you're a practitioner listening to this, PCCA is one of the best like compounding, like regular regulatory group. I can't, what, what is, exactly give, give me the words for PCCA. So I say it right. They're actually a company that does make chemicals. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, so they do make chemicals. They also make hormones. And so they, they actually make all of these things. Um, when it comes to bases, which PCCA also makes, it does matter about the base. So someone like me who has rosacea, number one, if you have rosacea, it's a gut problem, so fix it. Number two, vitamin C, which a lot of anti-aging creams have in them, you cannot put it on people with rosacea, whether it's pustular or whether it's the red rosy cheek rosacea, mm -hmm. it will, vitamin C will make it worse. A lot of anti-aging creams have vitamin C in it, but not for the people with rosacea. And I put people with sensitive skin in a base called Zematop. It's spelled with an X, not a Z, said with a Z, but Zematop is for any kind of thing that you want to put on the skin as a base for people with allergies or sensitive skin. Um, when we look at bases, a trevus, if you can't get testosterone into the body, male or female patient, we put it in a trevus base. Uh, there's things that are really hard to get in the skin, like magnesium, big chemicals like iron. Then we use a different base called lipoderm. Mm -hmm. So it does matter what bases that the prescriber also puts it in as well. That's good to know. That's good to know. And I think for a lot of folks who are listening to this and, and kind of navigating the world of bioidentical therapies, knowing the bases and, and being able to ask. And obviously your, your local compounding pharmacist is going to be your wealth of knowledge in that department, because that's, I mean, this is how I got into all of this is my, our local compounding pharmacist is one of my best pals because we, as they should be. <laughs> yes. Yep. No, we talk, we probably talk like more than I talk to some of my best friends. So let's talk about the basics for longevity. We've talked about hormones. We've talked about lowering caffeine. What are some of the other tidbits that you've got? Give us a little, little pre like teaser about the book of what we can find and that folks can take from this podcast and start doing today to work on their longevity. Well, thank you for asking that because it's probably going to surprise people. And again, this is my book, What You Must Know About Women's Hormones, the second edition, second edition, the hormone in here, insulin. If I could just choose one hormone that will affect longevity, it is insulin, which regulates your blood sugar. If your blood sugar is not perfect, if it's not optimal, you notice I didn't say normal. If it's not optimal, then it leads to insulin resistance. It leads to diabetes eventually, which will put weight on you, increases your risk for all cancers, increases your risk of heart disease, stroke, and cognitive decline. Those are all diseases of aging. So insulin, probably if I could just choose one and believe me, everything we've talked about today is just as important, yeah, but yeah. insulin regulates all of that. And that big, you know, you asked me what you could do for lifestyle insulin you make in the morning at 10 AM. If you do not eat breakfast, it is the biggest mistake you will ever make in your life. Your mother was right which he said that breakfast is the most important meal it is. If you do not eat breakfast, then it teaches insulin to work ineffectively in your body. And then you end up with insulin resistance. You also make insulin between five and 6 PM. 
If you're routinely eating at eight or nine, then also insulin will work ineffectively in your body. And it will again, start climbing and you'll end up with insulin resistance where insulin doesn't work as well. So the biggest tip, tip to have eat breakfast, eat a full breakfast. They were absolutely right when they said that you should eat like a queen or king in the morning and then by evening, eat like a pauper. They are totally correct. More in the morning, some at noon, little bit at nighttime. Wow. You know, this goes against a lot of what's out there. And, and to be honest with you, I've kind of seen that what you're saying fits when, we, when I look at all of my patients and their routines. And the fasting and the keto thing and all of that, it, it does seem to, to cause some issues. Now, I'm a fan of, of stopping eating by around 6, 7 p.m. And then, you know, we do have some time going through till the, the 10 a.m. time, a little bit of intermittent fasting, but not a, a huge fan of every day doing, you know, one meal a day. It, it does seem like that can be a problem and, and definitely a fan of making sure folks get breakfast. Well, when people do intermittent fasting wrong and they skip breakfast as they're part of the intermittent fasting, yes, they may lose weight for a short period of time, but you know what? It goes all right back on because then their insulin goes up and the weight goes back on anyway. It's not how the body works. So just like you, you know, don't eat after 7 p.m. Honestly, there's not a reason to do that. I rarely eat after 6 p.m., very, very rare. And then, you know, eat breakfast before 10. That's still a long time of fasting. If you're doing intermittent fasting, it still works that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Now, of course, this leads me into another big debate that a lot of folks might be thinking about right now. There's the whole concept of taking metformin like all the time, if you want to keep your insulin in check. And, and in my mind, I'm going, I don't know if that's necessarily a good idea or not. I'd love to get your opinion on that. Well, metformin is the only known anti-aging drug. Mm -hmm. It does deplete the body of coenzyme Q10 and B vitamins. So if you're on metformin, you do need to take CoQ10, you do need to take B vitamins twice a day, but if we're having insulin not working well in the body, it's always best if we teach people how to exercise, if we teach them how to eat, we start with nutrients like chromium and alpha lipoic acid and bergamot and berberine and other things that help regulate insulin, then we start a medication if needed. Yeah, I think that's important because I, I do have a lot of people coming to me and saying, doc, I just need a prescription for metformin. And I'm like, are you diabetic? Do you have, you know, are, are you pre-diabetic? What's going on here? And so, yes, it, it's the simple things like what you just mentioned about when, you know, eating your breakfast, cutting, you know, having food reduce into the evening. It, it's the simple things versus trying to take a medication and, and a pill to uh, cover, cover it all up or clean it up for you. I don't know which way was best to say. Well, sometimes all of this is hard work. Yeah. It does take effort, but honestly, if you don't have your health, what do you have? Mm -hmm. You don't have a whole lot. So people do need to want to be able to work at it. They do need to be able to say, you know what? It's okay if I spent some money on nutrients, et cetera. You know, I'd much rather spend my money on nutrients than to go out and have a fabulous meal because which one is going to help me have longevity, but not just longevity, be a healthy 100 years of age. It's all about perspective. You got to weigh it out like that. And that's the perfect way to, to kind of sum it all up here. What, what do you want? You know, and, and I'm, I'm game for 105 or, or longer. I don't know. Maybe I could run for some Guinness book of world records. I don't know. I think, I think we'll just see how it plays out. Oh my goodness, Dr. Smith, thank you so much again for coming on and telling everybody about what they need to know or what they must know. Let's put it that way about women's hormones. So you guys, you got to check out our book, Hormones and Longevity. It's the second edition, the big fat edition to get all the info. And you know what? Maximize uh, Your Immunity is her other book. We talked about it earlier. If you haven't seen that podcast, just go back, listen to that one as well. You can find all of her books over at the website, mdpamelasmith.com forward slash books forward slash and there's her book she's shown it to us right now women's hormones and she's just what we must know because it, it's a confusing world out there and 
Dr. Smith is the guru, guys. You're not going to hear any better information than what you got right now. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity, truly. It's really important that women know a lot about their bodies and how it works. And don't forget in December, our book, Maximize Your Male Hormones, that one is going to look at male hormones as well. And she'll be back on, guys. Don't you worry, because I want to make sure everybody has all the information they can possibly get. Well, thanks again. And oh my goodness, guys, you better just start taking notes, get the pen out and just write down everything you just learned and listen again. Thanks again, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.